Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India start this lecture uh, with a thought process from Rudyard Kipling. The gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade, good said the varun sitting in the hall, but iron, cold iron is master of them all. It is a very great statement of stating that iron is very important. Today, we will be discussing about iron and wood steel, advanced material technology of ancient India. And in the last few lectures, we have looked at various facets of ancient Indian technologies, but today we will be looking at uh, this iron, which is quite important even today. So, if you look at when we ask this question, why is iron important for our life? then naturally because iron is the most widely used of all elements accounting for 95 percent of worldwide metal production and iron is one of the metal that can be recycled fully so that it can be made sustainable unfortunately we are not doing that globally but it can be done so, therefore, uh, iron is very important even today and it has been used by various applications like namely uh, machinery, automobiles, sieves, engineering components, building materials, agriculture and several other aspects of engineering and domestic uh, applications. And because it has lower cost and high strength, and therefore, that is being used profusely for engineering and domestic applications. And fortunately, India is having a very large reservoir of the iron ore and iron ore is basically rocks with mainly iron oxide. It can have uh, various colors from the dark gray, bright yellow, deep purple to rusty red and uh, types of iron ores whatever we get in our country are basically if you look at magnety, hematite, limotite and siderite and uh, mostly uh, we are having large reservoir of hematites and of course the magnetite is the one which will be basically can be known as it will be uh, identified by its magnetic properties and hematite's color will be little rusty red kind of things which I have shown here and the large reservoirs of India belong to this category of the iron ore that is hematite. And if you look at uh, the map, iron ore map of India that most of all the states except maybe Kerala or Jammu Kashmir and then maybe Delhi, Himachal Pradesh and of course the Uttar Pradesh, uh, rest of the states are having large reservoirs of the iron ore mines and you can see that these spots are basically corresponding to mines that are being identified for getting iron ore. So, which is uh, quite uh, a large amount and therefore, we are basically fortunate enough to have iron ore and which is very important. But unfortunately, uh, we are using these metals or, and also the iron is too much uh, because the resources is limited and it can be really uh, depleted soon. So, therefore, uses should be small and the pollution created due to the production of iron can be minimized provided use less. 
and you should improve the quality of the iron and steel being manufactured such that its lifespan will be very high. So, uh, that is the uh, challenge one, one has to take today, but however, we will be looking at uh, basically various clues from our ancient iron technologies, but let us look at brief chronology of iron uses in ancient India and I have made it as small as possible just to give you a bird's eye view of the various applications what were being used by our people uh, from the time immemorial. Even if you go to the before 500 BC that means, it can be basically 1000 uh, BC onwards people started using iron ore and recently some studies say uh, claims that it is not 1000 BC. BC means before common era, it is basically 1600 before common era the irons items were being used. So, if you look at various items which were used uh, during this period before 500 BC is household uh, uh, items, agricultural building tools, iron swords and daggers and what uh, people claim is that a period Vedic periods. Of course, uh, some people claim there was a iron, but some people also having difference of opinion about that. But if you go by this 1500 to 500 BC, certainly iron were being used because people got evidence out of it. Beside this, uh, the other parts like uh, various parts where the already uh, people got the evidence of uh, ancient iron which are being rusted and the carbon dated found out. Those places are Lodal in Gujarat, Ahar in UP, Gufekral in Kashmir Valley, Antraji Khera in UP, Halar in Halur in Karnataka which was around 1000 BC, Tine Valley in South India around 550 BC. So, these are the uh, places where people got hard evidence of iron artifacts and items. So, 300 BC to 3rd BC uh, during which the Chandragupta, Asoka and the King Hubiska and the other kings were there in this uh, in our country and what evidence uh, we got from various places those items are uh, iron stupa swords, dagger, agriculture equipments, coins and clamps and various other things and 1 to 100 CE and apart from these uh, iron uh, items made of irons uh, and steels, the people got also iron spearheads and nails and they found in Piparawa in UP. And 500 C, uh, of course, uh, we are aware of uh, this rustless iron pillar, which is now located in New Delhi. And uh, beside, uh, earlier, of course, it was in Bishnupada, we will be discussing about it. And there, in other places, also iron uh, stupas or pillars were being erected by various kings. And uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, 600 to 1200 C that iron beams were used for as a structural in particularly in temple to take the load of the temple which is uh, made of stone. And uh, according to me, uh, this is the first time in the entire world where the iron beams were used and these uh, places where you can get evidence is Bhuvaneshwar, Puri and Konak temple still it is uh, you know these beams are existing being used. Of course, uh, some of them are getting corroded that is uh, one problem one has to uh, overcome and see that this should not be corroded such so that uh, there might be some damage to the temple. And of course, there is an era uh, where 1500 to 1800 CE particularly during this um, Muslim rule and the iron guns and cannons were designed and developed in this country and which were being used very much and um, the places where you could get these iron guns and cannons which are being um, preserved is Tanjore, Bijapur and several other places across the country. 
So, this is about basically a brief chronological account of iron uses in ancient India. But uh, if you go to the Vedic eras, the, that is a, a literary evidence like IS, IS means iron uh, has been used several times in Rig and other Vedas. But of course, there is a little controversy about uh, IS, people say it is a metal, but some scholars they claim it is iron. Uh, and the word Ayodhmastra is basically iron tusk in uh, Atharveda you can see these are the volume numbers and the uh, richas and the word Ayojala basically iron nets and uh, iron hooks are being used in several places in Atharveda. So, therefore, if I consider the IS as iron the naturally very uh, great technology of making various complicated items uh, were there at that time. Uh, but of course, these are the literary evidence and uh, even people have used this uh, as a prayer like uh, in Vedas, Athar Veda that is Homes V to the D, O Nirti, Thou of Kin kinness unfashioned the burnt fetters of iron. So, that is also indicate that iron was used as a, a very much that is a common word in that at the time therefore, they have used uh, basically as a, a similitude. So, there is another uh, slokas from Athar Veda, Ayasmaya, Drupadi and others like thou west bound here it an iron post bridle with the death that are a thousand. So, this is a basically a pillar kind of thing which uh, people are already described in the slokas of Athar Veda. Therefore, uh, we can say that from this application it looks to me that iron is the uh, where being used uh, at that time. Therefore, it is commonly it has come on the richas or the slokas of Vedas. Beside this the earliest iron age sites in South India that is Halur in Karnataka and Adi Chanalur in Tamil Nadu which is around 1000 BC. And in the epic period something 500 BC to 100 BC you will find basically one sloka I have taken from Manusmati chapter 11 which says that Mani Mukta Pravaranang Tamrasya Rajatasya Cha Aya Kansyo palanang cha dvadasahang kananata. That means, aya means basically it is iron, it is very clear this word ayas is basically not the metal, but rather iron because in this locus there are several others like tamra, raja and other things kansya are all other metals are there, so also ayas. So, therefore, it must be the iron. Aya means it is iron, so also Is is the iron which was used in Veda. So, from this argument one can say that uh, iron uh, was used for various for fabrication of various items in during Vedic period also. So, let us look at uh, the prehistoric antiquities in uh, Tine Valley of Tamil Nadu which I have shown here, these are the iron uh, swords and these are daggers smaller in size made of iron and these are hard evidence which people archaeological survey of India have found out which around something 1902 and, and these daggers is uh, around something 18 to 12 inches and whereas, the uh, sword is around 2 to 2.5 feet and beside this people got evidence about spades, arrows, javelins, lances, iron clamps which were made of iron. And uh, it is told that this might be the earlier version of wood steel what we are going to discuss today. Of course, more evidences, more research uh, record really to prove that those were made of wood steel which is a very very advanced material 
considered with respect to the present time. Beside this, in Ayurveda, there are various kinds of instruments are being used, which is uh, mentioned in Susruta Sahita and uh, surgery was conducted in ancient India. There is no doubt about it because various Western researchers have really have claimed that one and it has been proved. And uh, what being mentioned that to 125 kinds of surgical instrument made of iron were used for carrying out the surgery at the time. And some of the uh, schematic of these tools I have shown here, which is a very, very fine and uh, very difficult to manufacture even today, because it is very sharp and it will be very, what you call, uh, complicated to manufacture. And at that time, they were having technologies, uh, I guess, so that uh, they might be using it and uh, also it should not be uh, affecting the body that is also important thing what they are doing. So, uh, and uh, most of us we are aware about this rustless iron pillar. This is your basically iron pillar which is located currently at Delhi in the uh, Kutab Minar and this you can see, but this was basically was not in Kutab Minar during the uh, Muslim invasion, it was being basically taken from the um, original place which is the Sanchi or the Bidisa. And this was, this iron pillar was manufactured uh, during the era of Chandragupta II which is around 400 to 413 C and it was basically erected in the honor of Lord Vishnu on the mount of Vishnupada or Udayagiri, today it is known as Udayagiri uh, mountain and located near Sanchi and Bidisa about 50 kilometer from the Vopal, which is the capital of the MP. And this was a really a very marvelous, is one of the wonders what we are having and it is still rustless having so many years of its existence. And it is subjected with the climatic condition changes, it is exposed to the climate, still it is rustless and that is lot of research uh, being done. Why it is so, although some of the theories have been put forwarded by various researchers, but still then people have not got the complete picture why it is rustless. So, if you look at irons were being used by various places which uh, and various uh, era, in the very long uh, era it has been used, but however, they were having also knowledge to classify and various kinds of uh, iron were being used which can be classified according to its properties. It can be basically classified into three categories, one is uh, soft iron or Kantaloha and Tixna Loha carbon steel and Mundala Loha is a cast iron. And again this soft iron is divided into another five kinds according to the ancient scriptures. Brahmaka is very soft magnetic iron, Chumbaka is a basically mildly magnetic and stick to iron pieces and Karsaka it can attract iron objects and Dravaka it is a very strong magnetic iron, but maybe Karsaka is little bit lower uh, than the Dravaka, but it will be Karsaka will be having higher magnetic uh, qualities as compared to the Chumbaka. Romaka is basically permanent magnet that develops strong magnetic field around the uh, magnet. It can be of various uh, mukha means faces like Eka mukha, Dwe mukha, Tri mukha, like Sarva mukha, that means several of them. So, uh, various kinds are there. And uh, the, this carbon steel, which is again divided into uh, six categories Khara, it develops a good cutting edge, breaks on bending. And uh, Sara is subter iron and it has fibrous fractures. And uh, 
Hanala is it is hard and tough, has fibrous fractures, and Travata develops good cutting edge, and Bajra it has good hardening and tempering property and hard cutting edge. I guess this Bajra might be known as the ooze, ooze steel in modern time, and Kala it develops hard cutting edge after blue tempering. And beside this, Mundalva is again divided into three categories. Mridu, Kunda and Kadara and Mridu means soft brittle iron that may be grey cast iron, it has a low melting point and Kunda is a mortal grey iron and Kadara is a white cast iron. So, if you look at they had classified the iron depending on its properties, unfortunately in modern time these aspects are not a part of curriculum. So, therefore, it is important to introduce these things and also uh, augment this with the modern classification if it is there that it indicates that people were having the enough knowledge about iron. So, I will be talking about iron making furnaces because uh, furnace was important and uh, people have got evidence for that and several small and large furnaces were used till 18th century for making iron from the iron ores and unfortunately uh, due to the British rule and their policies this uh, furnaces and this procedure of uh, being making iron indigenously was lost and these furnaces were called vati Koti or Kosti, of course, this uh, in different languages name will be different when made from locally available clay and internal contours of some of furnaces were lined with natural china clay or a refractory materials and the furnaces were made either uh, below the ground level or on the sloping of the hillock or above the ground level. The most of furnaces uh, was having two holes, one for charging and discharging and other is for discharging of uh, molten metal and slag. Generally uh, two, two years or, or the pipe is used for supplying the air. So, classification of ancient furnace one can say that uh, various three kinds one can uh, classify, but of course, there are several other varieties. The furnace in South India were having bowl shaped hearth and conical shaft. The cylindrical furnace of MP were bloom or uh, removed from the top of the furnace. Koti type furnace of Bhopal, Ujjain with a square or rectangular cross section for large production of iron, which is around 250 kg per day. But mostly the furnaces what were used in ancient India can produce a small quantity of the iron per day, uh, but this is a, a this kind of furnace uh, was exceptional to other other one. Let me talk about a one kind of furnace which is used even people claim something 700 BC in Nalanda and this furnace is known as Naikun furnace because it was excavated near the Naikun for the first time and Khairedis and Uzaini and other places. So, uh, if you look at it is having a circular clay bricks which are being placed it is like a uh, kind of a inverted it is like a cone kind of shape it is a tires through which the air will be passing through it and these are of course, the charcoals and these are blooms which will be coming and these are the tabbed slags which is passing through that. and. Uh, so, these you can see even today like I have shown here, uh, it is basically made from the prefabricated clay bricks whereas, other furnace were uh, being uh, constructed by digging holes on the earth and this is similar to that like you are having. So, this is known as a bloomery furnace and uh, there is another furnace Dhatwa furnace if you look at this is a, a being below the ground the peat is being made and this is your ground level and smelting charges are being placed here and then burning fuels and these are the bellows through which uh, 
air, pressurized air can be passed through and this is the person which will basically actuating the velocity, which will be air will be passing through this, air will be moving into this, so that uh, you will be getting uh, you know, oxygen enough for the combustion to take place and you will get the little higher temperature then. Beside this, this is a uh, furnace which was obtained even till it was used maybe 20, 30 years back, but today it is discontinued by the tribals of Bishnupur. And this furnace, uh, if you look at <coughs> the smelting furnace, and uh, this is having a height of 800 mm, and uh, here it is a diameter on the bottom is 500 mm, on the top it is 150 mm, it is like a chimney that it will be allow the hot gases to move up. And uh, if you look at, if you take a cross section of this, you will get this cross section, these are also the furnace wall made of uh, bricks and other things. So, this is your tires and this is temperature charcoal wall, it will be and then it will be containing the charge. And of course, uh, there is a bamboo rope for support putting the bellows and then people can hold it and then uh, they can pressurize these bellows or actuate these bellows which are not shown here. In India, furnaces for iron smelting other seems to be reused after relining and repairing with the refracted clay unlike the cluster of furnace excavated in western countries. That means, if you look at uh, in the western countries, they were using the furnace once, after that they will make one another. But in our country, we are using, reusing it, that means it is more sustainable as compared to other one and uh, which I had not shown earlier. This is the bellows and these are the bamboo air pipes which will be putting so that a person will be uh, pressurizing it one by one in a sequence manner by jumping on it and or rather putting the pressure by the foot. And these are the slag pit which will be uh, collecting the slags on this pit and then of course, you can and uh, this portion is basically you can get here some regions. So, uh, and that is a quite uh, interesting and it is all made locally, you are not depending on the western countries or other things to do that. But today, if you look at it is we will have to depend on even uh, various parts of the blast furnace and uh, which is very simpler and very easy to operate. And these are using like bamboos and these heights, bellows is made of the heights of animals which were earlier available. And uh, see, these are all being made by design by the local people. and. Uh, so, uh, the, let me talk about another kind of a charcoal furnace which was used for even for Ayurvedic. This is known as Angar Kosti means charcoal furnace and uh, its extraction iron from biotite and by Ayurvedic method and uh, Sattva Patana process this is known as uh, like Sodhana basically purification of the iron ores and which is being to, done today also Bhavana maceration and titration, titrating and dhamana is heating and smelting which is has to be carried out. So, the liquid used for sodhana or the purification of minerals is kanji, fermented liquid like you can say it is basically fermented um, kind of curd and other uh, liquid. So, triple aquat like harira, bahara, uh, anla what we use for our um, health purposes and then cow's urine and cow's milk. So, these are the uh, constituents which are used for purification of minerals. Now, more research is to be carried out to find out what are the efficacies of these items which are available and which can be renewable also. So, uh, not that you will have to use some chemicals and uh, this will not affect the environment uh, as such. This process is accompanied intermediate bhavana leading to pelletization of chars, which is around something 20 to 30 mm balls with the following com compositions like mica 200 grams, borax or the flux which is used to separate the slag is 50 grams, 
and muesli powder is 50 grams which is act as a redundant uh, reducing agent. So, this is the furnace what uh, people have designed had designed earlier these are the velos and these are the elevations and these are the cross section of that or the top view you can say these are the velos and this is uh, which is shown here and this is the pipe and uh, this is your insulations and then these are the charcoals which will be using for uh, heating that thing and which contains the crucible. Crucible is a refractory uh, part where uh, you will be using basically the iron you will keeping and then um, that will be heated. So, proper dimensions are given that means it is basically uh, taken from the rasa uh, samuche and the furnace temperature of 1500 degree centigrade could be achieved as per the research done by Jai et al. And uh, because they are using charcoal and then they are using also the air to uh, augment the combustion. So, uh, this is basically high temperature one can get but more research is required and uh, to really uh, develop this kind of things and Rasaratna Samucha which was written around 800 C describes 51 kinds of metallurgical tools, 31 kinds of equipments, 17 types of crucibles and 9 types of furnace and 5 types of coatings on the on these furnaces and but now a lot of research must have been carried out which is not the case uh, unfortunately. So, that we can revive and give this uh, technology to the common people, so that they can develop the iron in a small quantity also they can use that thing for their creative purposes, so that they can redesign this furnaces according to their requirements and which is being hindered in case of a very big furnace like blast furnace. So, if you look at blast furnace I have shown here of course, you can get a very high temperature here this is the hot air and the slag will be going out and this is a molten iron molten iron will be out by this uh, pipe and there is a fire clays and this is the cup and cone arrangement for the flow of iron limestone and coke lucid manner. But however, uh, that is very important for the performance of the blast furnace. Blast furnace is size is quite huge the length is something 20 to 35 meter and uh, diameter is 6 to 14 meter you cannot really uh, operate it you cannot redesign it you cannot really um, uh, redo something uh, or apply some creative uh, work or the you can change it according to your wish. As compared to that ancient furnace is a very small it is something 700 uh, mm height and 300 uh, maybe little bigger maybe 500 kind of uh, this will be around maybe 500 to 600 wheat kind of things right. And this is your place where the bellows and then charging will be taking place around 200. So, this is a very small one of course, the bigger one is there, but that cannot be really as big as blast furnace and these are simple in nature. So, that lot of changes uh, can be made by the users, but however, the problem with this kind of ancient furnace uh, is that the temperature is low around something 1200 degrees Celsius in which ferric oxide will be reacting with the carbon monoxide going to the iron and carbon dioxide. Keep in mind that in the blast furnace the uh, although the quantity of iron produced is quite large, but it also pollutes the uh, place where it is being installed too much. Whereas, this pollution whatever it will be coming from the small furnaces will be really dissipated in the local regions. So, therefore, from that perspective it is really uh, good and of course, the disadvantage is that low temperature. So, you will not get the uh, molten uh, iron out of it, uh, but however, this is uh, better than this. Uh, let us look at how does really it was taking place like iron ore undergoes the beneficiation and then you will get the rich iron, then it will be coming to the solid state reduction. So, there is a difference between 
the bloomery uh, iron what we are furnace what we are bloomery blooming iron blooms what we are getting because it was occurring under the reduction state and this reduction things was really coming up again in the modern time and the temperature is uh, maintain is around 1000 to the 1200 degree celsius of course uh, for that you will have to add this uh, wood or the uh, wood will be uh, from the wood you will get the charcoal through the partial uh, oxidation and this charcoal will be used for this uh, in this furnace. So, if you look at wood if we are using it is basically renewable in nature and so also sustainable provided you use is less quantity and the fluid slag will be coming out of here and you get the hot sponge iron if you hammer it then you will get iron lump people have now come up improve this uh, ancient technology they are now uh, getting also sponge iron and India happens to uh, produce a large quantity of sponge iron uh, maybe it is one of the uh, largest uh, sponge iron producing country in the world and they have basically looked at this uh, improve this uh, ancient technology and we can get a, a lot of cheaper iron being produced from the uh, iron ores. So, now we will be looking at another very important uh, steel what was being produced in ancient India which is known as wood steel and this is considered to be the advanced material technology of ancient India. So, uh, as I told that a lot of people may not be aware about this thing, it is a very remarkable story uh, that is not well known about the legendary of wood steel of ancient India. Wood steel if you look at is basically the uh, was originated in India. Uh, that is being uh, being accepted worldwide. The word wuz has originated as a mistranscription of word uk, which is basically an anglicized version of uku. The word uh, for steel in Kannada language and other South Indian languages will be having similar word that is uku, which is meaning is that it is basically to melt or diesel. Right. So, therefore, uh, this word is uh, you know uh, being transformed or rather mistranscripted into the wood steel. The word uh, also uh, being interpreted by the Benjamin Han who uh, really uh, inspected the Indian steel in maybe around 18th century in the seeded uh, districts and other Kannada speaking areas and he uh, interpreted that uku word might have come from ucha, ucha means superior that is of course, a Hindi word and uh, he was uh, informed that the steel was ucha kavina means superior iron also known as uku tundu in Mysore. That means, you know this word has been distorted now we know it as a wood steel of course, uh, it is not known uh, among the students and even faculty members of uh, engineering stream even. The wood steel was highly prized across several regions of the world. It is believed to have been used to make the Damascus blades with a swilled steel pattern uh, and the swords made of this India steel came to be known as Damascus sword. Damascus sword is quite famous among the uh, various warriors this I have shown is a uh, what you call a sword which is uh, quite sturdy and also it is a high strength and it is having a very sharp edge. So, if you look at the another sword of 1600 uh, centuries which I have shown that this uh, thick and heavy and deadly sharp and uh, uh, this is uh, basically forced from wood steel and the size of this sword is around 29 inches long and this is having a little curved and then distorted uh, maybe it will be having different armor capacity. So, these swords were used as weapon in the battles by Indian kings like stalwarts like Prithira Chauhan, Maharana Pratap, Sivaji, Tipu Sultan and uh, several of them and also the Sikh, war Sikh warriors. The swords of Sikh six were said to bear the bending and crumpling and yet be fine and sharp that is the 
uh, good quality or the speciality of the uh, wood steel and Alberuni uh, who lived around 973 to 1048 claims that there will never be another nation which understood the separate types of swords, their names than the inhabitants of India. And there are several ancient Greek and Roman literary reference to the high quality Indian steel since the time of Alexander's India's campaign. The story goes that like uh, during uh, this Alexander uh, invasion and he was gifted with 100 talents of Indian steel makers. Uh, beside this the numerous early literary references are being talking about the steel from India. So, that is why uh, it is considered that India was the father of the wood steel. Recently the researchers J. D. Bharo Evan, uh, who is a professor of material science and engineer of Iowa State University who is still uh, doing a lot of research on this wood steel and he has published a paper in 2018. That paper name is uh, revisiting the uh, wood steel. So, wood steel according to him wood steel was the first high quality steel made anywhere in the world according to the reports of the travelers to the east. The Damascus swords were made by forging small cakes of steel that were manufactured in southern India and this steel was called wood steel. It was more than a thousand years before the steel as good was made in the west. So, it is his person who has done a lot of research still doing uh, till today and uh, Edris the Arab traveler of 1200 uh, C uh, who says that the Hindus excelled in the manufacture of iron that it was impossible to find anything to surpass the age from the Hinduani or in Indian steel. The Indians had workshops where the most famous savaries in the world were forged. And let me just quote from uh, T. A. Richardson who was written a paper in 1939 on primitive iron smelting in America in the journal of archaeology who was commented that it was not made by the Arabs at the Damascus by the Chera Tamils in Hyderabad where it obtained the name Uz under which it was exported from India shortly before the Christian era. Of course, some of the scholars people always say that Damascus sword was basically uh, being uh, made first by the Arab people, but he has categorically uh, said that it is not from that rather from the India. So, uh, the, and that too that is uh, 1939. <coughs> so, Indian swords uh, made of wood steel I have shown here which is very sharp and it is also quite hard, its strength is quite high uh, and uh, not only that this is basically a helmet from wood steel which is a very very fine structure. See, if you look at these are chains being made uh, of uh, wood steel which was quite difficult even today to fabricate uh, by hand, but however it has been I have taken from the book of uh, Indian iron by late Balashubramanyam R who was my colleague and friend. Uh, he had uh, carried out a lot of research on archaeology, uh, ar archaeometallurgy and the typical body protection gear wrought iron. Uh, of the made of wood steel as shown here. This also photographs I have taken from his books and which is quite sturdy because it can really take the burn, uh, blow of the opponent's uh, force being applied by the sword and other things. So, wood steel is an ultra high carbon steel which is containing around 1 to 2 percent of carbon exhibiting properties such as super plasticity and high impact strain, it qualifies as an advanced material in modern terminology. So, that was being uh, developed and designed by our ancestors and these are the typical long swords made from the wood I have shown here which is taken from Mehrgarh Museum of Jodhpur and again I have taken from the uh, book of um, R. Balashubramanyam 
and typical small beds from the wood steel from Mergar Museum. These are the made out of wood steel and uh, again this photograph I, had, I have taken from his book. So, chronological evidence if you look at of the wood steel, it goes back to 300 BC, the crucible process in at uh, Kodum Manal of Tamil Nadu is basically related to wood steel, but nowadays people are claiming it is not 300 BC, rather 600 BC. And 100 BC Roman accounts of Seric iron pointing to the Chera region of South India and 300 C, C the Alexandria alchemisty Josimus of Panopolis publishes an unequivocal reference to Indian crucible C, crucible steel and 900 C crucible steel production spread to Central Asia in a very vigorous manner and 1589 uh, Jam Bastia della Porta of Italy emphasized the heat treatment of wood steel. Of course, uh, like um, several other researchers have done work in 1677 in a first enquiry in UK, Joseph Moxon sets the temp temperature limits for forging South Indian wood steel. They had made several attempts to reproduce the wood steel and in the beginning they were failing miserably, although they have got some success today, but according to me they have not really completely successful in making the uh, wood steel till that. 17th century AD, the tavernier accounts of export of 20,000 pounds of wood steel from the Golkana in Andhra Pradesh to Persia, manufacture cannon and firearms. And, and 1795, first scientific lecture by Machet of England on the wood steel and George Pearson present his work on the wood steel to the Royal Society, because the western people were really excited about this wood steel and they were carrying out several of research uh, and uh, they have also failed in the very beginning miserably as I told me earlier. The archaeological evidence suggests that crucible steel process, process started in the present day Tamil Nadu before the start of common era and the people got some of the identify old lumps. These are the old lumps of high carbon wood steel from Gulbarga in Karnataka and uh, fragments of newly identified remains of fire crucible, these are the basically uh, parts of the crucible used for steel production of South Arcot in Tamil Nadu. And as I told earlier, the Arabs introduced the Indian wood steel to Damascus, where an industry developed for making weapons of this steel. Arabs took ingots of wood steel to Damascus, following which a thriving industry developed there for making weapons and armors of the steel. Unfortunately, maybe with those uh, things they invaded our country and then we lost the independence. And 12th century of Arab traveler, Edris mentioned about Indiani as I had mentioned earlier. So, uh, then hence we can conclude that wood steel was the first manufacturer in ancient India, which is still considered to be the state of art technology of steel making in the entire world. So, uh, these are the blades of sword of Mahanagar Museum of Jodhpur. If you look at these are the swelling patterns like uh, what you get in the wood steel link patterns and, uh, and alternating dark and light phases, but why it is so we will see. Let me quote from the uh, evidence from the travel, travel log. Uh, from the 17th century onwards, several European travelers, including Francis Buch Buchan in 1807, Benjamin Hayen in 1818, and S. W. Weisse in 1832, Joseph Marcel Hath in 1840, observed the manufacturing of steel in South India by crucible process at several locations, including Mysore, Malwar, Golconda, and other places. So, about iron working during Tipu Sultan reign, uh, the Francis Buchan writes, there were numerous iron smelting furnaces and forges around the Channapatna and the finished products are being used for manufacturing arms and employing a large number of workmen. Tipu took it from the workmen at three 
Fanams, a mount, a nine ceilings and three and one and four pens, a hundred weight. He gave them, however, great employment. The surf, the furnace is constructed in a hut, consists of horizontal pit and a vertical fireplace sunk below the ground level. He has described very clearly how the furnace being uh, fabricated at that time. The ash pit is about three fourth of a cubit in width and a height and conducts from the lower part of the fireplace to outer side of the hut and where it ends in a square pit used for drawing ashes. The fireplace is a circular pit that descends from a surface of ground to the bottom of ash pit. Its mouth is a little dilated parallel to the ash pit a little distance from the mouth of the fireplace a mud wall is erected in order to seal the workman from the sparks and glare of the fire. The mud wall is about 5 feet high and uh, through the bottom of this passes an earthen tube which conducts into the fireplace the wind of the two bellows each made of bullocks hide and the crucibles are made in a conical form of unbaked clay. So, this is a detailed description has been given about the furnace and uh, the way they were manufacturing the wood steel. Let me show you a figure which has been uh, drawn basically from the accounts of Francis Buchan and uh, indicating that this is your furnace which is square and this is the, your fire stove and this is containing the charcoal and the circular pit and this is a perforated wall which will be protecting the people who will be there on the this bellows they will be actuating this bellows which is made of buffalo hide and such that the heat which is being generated in the furnace should not affect them. This is the furnace what one can uh, really get out from the account description of the Francis Buchan. So, let us look at uh, the processes involved uh, during the manufacturing of Damascus sword from Indian wood steel. Uh, if you look at the, as I had mentioned earlier that a furnace is being made in which uh, basically the iron ore and the charcoal are mixed together with the help of the bellows the air will be passing into this such that the 1200 degree Celsius one can uh, get and then the iron will be being made. And then this iron once this uh, sponge iron is being made this has to be hammered out such that you will get the wrought iron and then this wrought irons where basically are the bloom. These blooms are being broken into small pieces and again mixed with the charcoal in a crucible and put into uh, again to the furnace here the slow uh, and then it will be cooled slowly so that you will get the wood steel. And once you get this wood steel uh, then again it will be this wood steel has to be heated in 650 degree Celsius to 850 degree Celsius which is very important you will have to control this temperature uh, in this range. And then you will have to again take this and forging, forge it that means hammer it with the uh, various forging processes like fullering and then uh, uh, and hammering there are several other processes are there that has to be done in very uh, nice way otherwise you won't get the proper uh, structure what you want to have. After that then what you will have to do you will have to heat again uh, and treating that pieces from which you are making the sword and then it will be quenched and again it will be hardened blade which you will be getting. So, this process which I have shown in a very nutshell, but that uh, heating and then forging and then uh, again uh, quenching and this process is a very, very meticulously done in a several times so that you can get the proper shape and size and also control its hardness. So, uh, recently uh, the researcher have really uh, looked at more carefully, they have taken the original Damascus sword made of wood steel and they have also reconstructed the uh, wood steel 
in uh, recent time and uh, that is the micrographs which are being shown here. And this is uh, work is done by the Vero Evan in the mystery of Damascus blade of scientific America in 2001. And uh, you can see that on cooling, uh, these are the patterns uh, which are being shown in the original Damascus which is very bright and then uh, dark color. And on cooling of the ingot of the wood steel, the fine pine tree like formations which are being, uh, being made here. So, these are uh, you know dendrites and uh, this is basically on the microscopic level are formed extending to the molten steel. So, uh, actually input is atoms like a frozen in places they get frozen first and then afterwards of course, get into this uh, finger like or the pine like uh, structures which are uh, being solidified and these are of course, the liquid hot liquid metals. And, um, and what they claim the atoms of vanadium or any other impurities rapidly segregate out of the solid iron like beads on a necklace, right. These are the uh, impurities watch it there. So, uh, and subsequently what happens that cycle of heating and cooling, uh, these impurities atoms are the basis for the growth of hard iron carbide cemented particles. And these are being shown as a light colors. So, these uh, light colors are basically uh, cementite particles, particles. And uh, if you look at it, it is quite uh, very clear in the original Damascus stored of the wood steel, whereas the modern reconstruction is not that clear. So, therefore, I feel that uh, although they have attempted to uh, refabricate or reconstruct it, but I think that is it is not matching well. So, therefore, there is a more scope for doing research and also reconstruct in proper way. So, uh, let me conclude with few remarks this that India was in the forefront of iron steel manufacturing even uh, till 18th century, which was destroyed due to the wrong policies by the British ruler at the time. And the modern steel making is quite costly and environmentally unfriendly, whereas the ancient steel making uh, was cheaper and that encourages creativity among people and also it is not environmentally that uh, unfriendly. So, the archaeological findings indicate that high grade high carbon crucible steel does have the ancient history in India and uh, ancient technology is quite small in scale as I had mentioned, which can be adopted by the semi skilled people does generate employments and least pollutions as distributed across the large area. And research efforts over the past 200 years to know how these wood Damascus blades were made and why the surface pattern appeared have not resolved completely. And the recent investigation on the ultra high carbon wood steel being super plasticity justified it being called the advanced material of ancient world with not merely a past, but also a future. So, therefore, it is very important for us to relook at our ancient uh, steel technologies and also the other technologies and adopt it in the modern time such that it can generate more employment and we can also uh, activate and actualize our creativity uh, and we can really contribute more for the development of our glorious nation. So, my objective of taking this lecture was to expose the students and also other people to the technology what we are having which can be adopted and which can be reused, which can be uh, really uh, redeveloped in such a way that it will be environmentally benign, cheaper and indigenous using the local material. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.